So Greg, welcome to the podcast. Um, could you first start by telling the audience what it is you do and what your name is? Uh, my name is Greg Overacker. I'm a private investigator. I got involved with Brianna Maitland's case back in 2006, just after Father's Day. And uh, I had seen her poster, a missing poster, while I was on the thruway. And, and contacted an organization who kind of set up a search for her and helped distribute the, the, the posters and things like that, help create them and things like that. They're called Class Kids. Class Kids are, are uh, a group that was set up by Holly Class's father, Mark. And you'll recognize Mark. He's on television quite often. Daughter was murdered, Polly. She was abducted from, from the, her mother's home. But um, they set up a search for the Maitlands and did a great job. And uh, I sent them an email, and I can't remember Mark's uh, first guy in command there, but um, he put me through to the Maitlands. And eventually Kelly and Bruce called me, and that's how I got to know them. Oddly, I, I, I was with my daughter, and we stopped at the throughway so she could use the restroom. And, and you know... Being with a young girl in a, in a throughway stop, I was kind of on her like a hawk and had to wait outside the, the restroom for her to go in and use it. And while I was sitting there, there was Brianna's missing poster, which I wasn't unfamiliar with. You know, when you travel a lot and you, well, when I did used to work for Bail Bondsman full time, I travel up and down the East Coast. I was in and out of police stations all the time. And there were entire walls just dedicated to missing people, posters everywhere, something that you get used to seeing, not used to seeing. How did Bruce and Kelly call you back? Did you, you told them that you were working with private detectives and you were interested in helping? Yeah, that was basically the message to class kids was that I would offer myself to work for them, uh, you know, just for expenses. You know, I always wanted to start a not-for-profit that would do that for families of missing children because if you look at the cost of a private investigator, uh, no average family can afford it. You're, you're talking some of these guys charge $100, $200 an hour plus expenses. Kelly initially took me up on it. Bruce was really disenchanted with the investigation. Of course, they were both heartbroken. And uh, Kelly and I kind of uh, bonded immediately. But uh, later, it was Bruce and I that became close. And Bruce and I are still friends to this day, very close friends. Were um, Kelly and Bruce together at the time? They were together at the time. They had actually moved out of Vermont. If you look at where Maura Murray went missing and you look at where Brianna went missing, of course, the time frame's relatively close. And it's about 90 miles apart. Um, uh, Brianna went missing in Montgomery, Vermont. Um, but the Maitlands had a hard time living there. Uh, if you can imagine every day when you get up and walk out your door, everyone gives you a forlorn look because of what has happened to your child. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a uh, densely populated area. Everybody knows everybody. But their house actually had safety measures up, and I asked them about that. Of course, they had some very big dogs, angry dogs, well, at least to me, <laughs> and alarms on their driveways and things like that. People actually were threatening them which is an odd thing to think that misery begets misery. You know, I mean, they're already upset enough as it is, and now people are threatening them. It was threats that came after Brianna's disappearance? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, strange strange little threats would come here and there. And so they, they protected themselves what little they could. And Did the threats continue after they moved? Yeah, to a degree, yep. How did the threats come? You know, I'd have to ask Bruce about that. Um, you know, at one point, it was odd after a newspaper article came out, they, they have a son, uh, Waylon, who lived in Vermont. He also received threats. He received letters in his mailbox, things like that. One of them came to Waylon after a, a newspaper article was released, which was threatening towards his uh, companion at the time. Without getting into specifics of uh, the details of the threats, was it something or were any of the threats something where you or law enforcement or the family took seriously in a sense of this is a person who might know what happened to Brianna? 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, an article was released, uh, written by Hank Alberelli, and he released the most informative articles on Brianna and Mora, as far as I know. And the one that he released, named some names, talked about a talked about a, a, a police affidavit that I found, and we weren't supposed to have the affidavit. So the article was written, and then, you know, there were names in it. And uh, then the threats came to, to Whalen. Whalen no longer lives there. He's moved since. When I sat down with the Maitlands... They were living in Governor, New York at the time. When I sat down with them and they laid everything out on the table and gave me as much information as they could, it was so overwhelming. There was so much information. It was just mind-boggling. And because, much like Morris' case, there's really not much to go on, you know, everyone is theorizing what happened. And that can get very confusing, get overwhelming. But the threats that came were at different intervals, it just confused things even more. I mean, it was never anything that could be used to locate anybody or question anybody or anything like that. It just seemed really horrific to me that after the misery that this family, well, during the misery that this family was going through, that on top of it, someone threw salt on the wound, you know, and it happened here and there. That is crazy that people will go out of their way to threaten the family, especially when you said how small the community is. I can remember going up through there the first couple of times. You know, initially I was involved quite a bit. And then as time went on, I was just asked to do specific things, which is beginning again. I I took some time off from it for a couple of different reasons. But, you know, Bruce and I always stayed in touch. But When I initially went up there, I can remember driving through, and if you're not familiar with that area, they refer to as the Northern Kingdom, you wonder where everyone works. I remember driving through there and saying, where the hell do all these people work? Well, much like tourist areas here in the Adirondacks, people work for the highway department, they work for the school system, Um, they work at the local diners, they work at uh, the ski areas, um, a lot of farmers, things like that. But if you're not used to that kind of environment, it's very odd you guys have delved so much into Mora's case, you probably got a sense of that with that too, because I've been to Mora's crash site and you can just imagine if you were there in the middle of the night and someone shut your car headlights off, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You know, it's dark. That's interesting that you've been to Mora's uh, accident site. What, uh, what brought you by there? Well, when I got involved, of course, certain things had already came to be certain things had already happened and I was getting up to speed and stuff. So Bruce had me sit down with Hank Alberelli, much like he had me sit down with some people that are newly joined into this and get them up to speed. Hank got me up to speed. One of the things was that, uh, that came up was that there was, and Hank wrote an article about this was there was a curiosity whether the two were connected. If you look at them superficially, you know, Moore's car is found, crashed, abandoned on the side of the road. She's gone, never to be seen again. Brianna's car is found, crashed, abandoned, never to be seen again. Once you delve into things prior to that, they're much different, or they, at least they seem to be. And, you know, I always get upset when you sit down and you talk to people about this. Even people in the know, there's, there's a lot of people who have their you know, their facts confused or their their stories come into it or theories and everything. If you look at Mora's situation, you know, Mora was a person who was left at an undesignated time to an undesignated destination that we know of. We don't know what her plans were. It all seemed very sketchy. And we know of no threats to, to Mora or anything like that. If you look at Brianna, she was leaving work at 1120 at night driving to a specific location 
and a car stopped a mile and a half down the road in an area where people wouldn't normally stop. And if you look at the vehicle, it didn't end up that way on its own. She either put it there or someone else did. Um, whereas Mora slid off the road, as far as we can tell. She was, she was in a crash. Um, so there's, there's a lot of differences, but it's just difficult to sit you know, with certain people if they, if they don't know the facts to, to that part of it. It can get confusing. Superficially, it looks related. You look deeper, it really doesn't. And the state police had come out and said, we don't believe that these two things are, are related. And that's the other thing that uh, brings the two cases together is the fact that, the, as far as I know, both families are kind of fed up with how law enforcement has treated the respective cases, right? The Vermont State Police will come right out. The people that are handling Brianna's case now will, uh, will come right out and say that, look, initially this, this was screwed up. It was, it was done very poorly. Those people are since gone. Um, and the family is very confident with the, the investigators that are in there now and have been for a long time. So that's kind of, that attitude has changed. There's a lot of horrible mistakes made in Brianna's case. I mean, it was, it was bad, but some very confident people took over and their hearts are in it. So that's a good thing. You know, Bruce and Kelly met with Fred at one point when this was going on and this was a big discussion and their hearts go out to him, um, you know, I, going back to the whole threat thing, I hate to see when people bash Fred, really do. I just think it's ridiculous on its face to think that Fred had anything to do with this. I think where the problem comes in is with like Morris case and Fred is where there may be a certain situation. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Well, let's use the rag and the tailpipe. Actually, when I first heard that, I asked my mechanic, I said, what would happen if you stuck a rag in my tailpipe he said well your car wouldn't run for real long he said eventually your car would quit you know that, that exhaust has got to go somewhere well when you're driving up through where mora was traveling if you're if you she pulls into a, a rest stop or something along the side of the road and somebody sees her and stuff set into her tailpipe he knows whichever way he follows her she's going to go to a probably semi-remote area and then she's going to conk out and he's going to be right there so that, that theory is something that is, is pretty reasonable. But then the whole talk of, well, Fred told her to put it into her tailpipe so that, you know, so that uh, the car didn't smoke, so she didn't get pulled over and things like that, which I don't know if that's true or not true. I don't know. I, I'm not really, not really, really up on Maura's case other than what I've heard on your show and things that Bruce has told me and things like that. But um I think that's nuts. I would never tell my child to, to stick something like that in their tailpipe. But if that's what he did, that's what he did. I don't know if that's what he did. But that's just an example of how people that don't have facts, I mean, I'm sure he's explained that to the police or, or if that's a fact. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just something that we don't know. So we can all sit and talk about that for hours and come up with what we can come up with, you know. I've talked about it in the past. I've talked about it for literally months trying to figure out what what that was all about. And I think it's tough to uh, to do that and then come to the realization that, yeah, Fred probably already explained it and it's not a big deal. In Brianna's case, you know, she's driving a, an old 88 that her grandfather gave her, this big old boat of a car that you drive until it's expired and then you move on, but it's your first car that your grandfather gave you and it is what it is. I mean, you could practically live in the thing. It's so big. It's like driving two couches around. Talk to us a little bit about how the car was found. Brianna's car, when, when you leave the Black Lantern Inn, which no longer exists, um, I'm not sure what it is now, if it's even a functioning business, but it was an inn, and she was washing dishes there. Uh, she punched out 1120 at night, and normally she would stay and you know have a little something to eat and, and talk with her coworkers and things like that, but she had to be to uh, work the next morning. So she got in her car and she drove away, about a mile, mile and a half down the road, on the left side of the road, which had been on the uh, uh, other side of the oncoming traffic, was a building called the Dutchburn Home. It was what it was referred to locally. It was an, an old farmhouse. It just sat all by itself. The reason they called it the Dutchburn Home was because two elderly men had lived there all their lives. Uh, they were, someone broke into their home, robbed them, assaulted them. Uh, they were you know, taken away to be to a hospital uh, and never returned home. They both went into nursing homes. 
after that. It was a very sad situation. I think the whole home, home became kind of known for that. But if you were driving past this house, uh, this farmhouse, you could pull off at a gradual grade across the oncoming traffic or if you're coming the other way, just pull off the road and pull up in front of the house kind of. It was, it's almost looked like that's the way the people that live there always parked. Um, it was alongside the road. I mean, sat back a little ways, not too far. Her car was found as though she had pulled across oncoming traffic. Of course, there at the, uh, you know, almost midnight, there is no traffic. Um, and then backed up pretty at a pretty good clip, backed into the house hard enough to where uh, a piece of plywood that was boarded up over one of the windows fell down on the back of the house. The odd things about it were, you know, the police have some photographs. That, an, an officer came by the next day and he saw the car and he took some photographs of it. Supposedly, and this is something that we're not quite clear on, picked up a broken necklace and some things off the ground and threw him into the car and left. He got another call and he left. He just figured it was a drunk driver. But if you looked at the car, it was in such a bizarre way that I, I don't see how he could come up with a, a drunk driver backing, you know, 30, 40 feet, 45 feet into this house. But that was the story. There was a, a very credible witness, an older man who came by uh, around 1230 and saw the car there with its lights on. 1230 in the afternoon? No, actually, it was 1230 at night. So there's that time frame where she leaves at 1120. And at 1230, the car spotted there. So in your opinion, the car went from the road directly to where it was found. And not what I'm getting at is, is there any indication that the car had been parked and then put into reverse at a later time and backed into the building? Well, we don't know. I mean, there was always the theory that she met someone there, that someone had contacted her. We heard that a lot, that somebody contacted her and said, hey, meet me there for whatever reason. And, you know, you talk to the locals and they're like, that's, you know, they used to call it the crack shack and things like that. This is out in the country. The kids will all tell you that nobody stopped it. Nobody went there, you know, for that kind of activities. So it was a really bizarre place. But it, it would have been a place where someone would say, hey, uh, meet me after work. I got to give you something or meet me after work and we'll have a quick beer and you go on your way or whatever. So we don't really know. But if you look at the time frame. Because we always heard these theories that she was, well, we heard stories that she had gone to a party and she'd overdosed. And then they planted her car there. The time frame just doesn't fit. I mean, it's got to be a round trip. If you, you, you can figure just by the time frame how far she could travel and then come back. She would literally have to go to a party, ingest something, die, and then everybody panics and goes into action and gets her car back there and does whatever they do with her, it would just have to be such a quick series of events. It, it doesn't seem, I'm not saying it's impossible. It seems incredibly unlikely though. Right. Because what you're saying is she left work at what, 1130. And then this credible witness saw the car with the lights on at 1230. So yeah, 1120, 1230. Yeah. What time did the boyfriend see? Was it her boyfriend that drove by and saw the car or ex-boyfriend that drove by that night and saw the car? Because of the fact that they lived in an area that, well, I don't know about you, but my high school was small, so you kind of dated through the, the class, you know. <laughs> I think everybody yeah. did that. But, you know, he was a local kid that she had dated on and off. Um, he was actually coming home and saw the car there at 4.30 in the morning, and he put his lights on it, and he said he thought it was her car. But, you know, in question, I think he was questioned pretty, uh, pretty tough. They said, well, why didn't you stop? He said, well, I could tell she wasn't there. And he also said, well, I'd been drinking. He was coming back from Canada. He had been at a bar up there. So he said, you know, I just, there was no need for me to really stop. That's, that's pretty odd to me. That, that's pretty odd to me. But he did, he did get questioned by the police and was determined that, uh, that he had nothing to do with any foul play involved. It just seems odd to me. Usually when I'm, when I'm drinking, like I, I feel like I would have, I'd be more inclined and maybe it's just me, but I feel like I would be more inclined to stop at something like that. He was, he was questioned pretty, pretty well. And, uh, he's still up there. He's a, he's a local guy. Um, but you know, I, like I said earlier, you know, I don't know what the police know. I know that they questioned him really hard. I know that they, you know, he had a reasonable 
explanation. And, you know, that goes back into a lot of different things, like with Morris' case, too. You, you start looking at every little thing, and then sometimes there's just a reasonable explanation. And, you know, he said he knew she wasn't there. He could see, he could see that she wasn't there. And maybe he thought that by driving away, there's only two directions to drive. Maybe he figured he would see her walking down the road or something like that. But he said he said he was drunk. He admitted he had been drinking and didn't want to get caught. And again, these are young kids. In the Disappeared episode, it brings up this moment when Brianna and her mom, Kelly, were shopping the day of her disappearance. And Brianna went out into the parking lot and came back a few minutes later when Kelly met her in the parking lot. And Brianna seemed to be acting differently. In your conversations with Kelly and Bruce, have you heard what what they believe that was? Or is there any insight on what they believe that interaction was they didn't know kelly was really upset about that um they didn't know but uh, i found a witness who told me who it was and what was said again i don't think that that's something i should go into without at least first talking to bruce about it but was it a face-to-face encounter or was it a um a phone call it was face-to-face and i can tell you that the, the, the what i was told by this witness was that she was told not to go to work that night. That particular witness, uh, the police spoke to him. A few other people spoke to him. I, I kind of have some confidence in this guy, and I, I don't know if the police don't. I don't think that they interviewed him as well as I think they should have. I kind of have a problem with that. But This is a witness to whatever happened outside of the store in the parking lot. Yeah, he actually didn't. He wasn't an eyewitness. He said that the person who spoke to her told him himself hey, this is what I told her not to go to work that night. So they were friends or just work acquaintances? or They were a little more than acquaintances, yeah. So if we're to assume that Brianna was abducted, which does seem to be the general estimation out there, so you're talking about a group of people now, at least a couple of people, two, three people who know what happened. If you look at where her car was found, in the time frame and everything like that where her car was you couldn't you couldn't park and walk away from there and be happy about it it's going to be a long cold walk you look at the weather from that night the best i could come up with was was eight degrees was the low and i think 34 was the high for that day if you were going to abduct somebody and you did it alone you know there was all these theories that someone was in her back seat and stuff like that if someone was going to kidnap her and they were in her back seat, what are they going to do once the car's there? What are they going to do? March her away in the dark? I mean, it's it's pitch dark unless you're walking by moonlight. But um, yeah, it, it's always been thought that there was more than one person involved. You know, <clears throat> you know, if you go through the the list of theories of, you know, uh, she ran off on her own, which is the most absurd one I've ever heard. If you believe she ran off on her own, uh, she'd have to have help. She's not just going to ditch her car there and walk away. Someone's going to know. Um, if she did go somewhere and something did happen to her very quickly, someone could, could come back and dispose of the car, but they'd have to have someone with them. What are they going to do then? I mean, they, they can't just bring the car back and walk a couple of miles, a few miles up the road. Um, it's all... in. It's kind of like with Morris' situation. You know, there's, that's why there's always been that theory that someone was in tandem with her. Well, the lights on in Brianna's car is uh, kind of sticking in my sticking in my head a little bit because the lights on su- that suggests uh, like departing the area in haste. I always thought that something took place there, and that she tried to get out of there, and because she was an inexperienced driver, that she slanted in reverse. Where someone like myself, I would back out onto the road. But a kid, kid's not going to do that. If you look at the picture of the car, the wheels are turned really hard. That's really interesting. Oh, yeah. It looks to me like something began while she was either behind the wheel or outside of the car, and she got behind the wheel. Maybe someone was reaching and throttling her, grabbing her by the hair, grabbing her by the clothing. She guns it in reverse, and she hits the house, and she's pulled out. And that's and that the car sits now because the car was towed and there was never any investigation done there we don't know if the car was in reverse if it was in park if it was in neutral we don't know but the only thing that kind of uh, makes you question that theory is when the car was found the doors were closed 
and the window was up. So, and this is a big old car. If somebody was reaching and throttling her and she gunned it in reverse, they'd run her, she would have run them down with the door. If she was coming away from the Black Lantern and she pulled up to the Dutchburn home, she would have had to have gone across the oncoming lane and then pulled onto this gentle grade of road. My thinking was if somebody met her there, they came from the other direction, they would now be bumper to bumper front facing each other. So if, if something happened and she's attacked and somebody's trying to throttle her or do whatever they're trying to do, and she gets behind the wheel, which it looks like happened, and she guns it in reverse. Like I said, I would I would back my back into my car up onto the road, but a kid's not going to do that. An inexperienced driver is going to back and try to do like a three point turn, yeah, to get out, yeah, yeah, yep. And what she did was run into the home really hard, and then she's extracted from the vehicle. Now. I don't know that that's what happened. Like I said, if somebody was reaching in there and she's backing up with that door open, she's going to mow somebody down with that door. But the person who told me what was said outside of the store when she was with Kelly said that uh, when she was taken at the Dutchburn home, the tall guy got in behind the wheel. And because she had the seat so far up, he couldn't reach the pedals correctly. And he tried to do that three-point turn, and he just hit the house and said, forget it, and got out of the car and left it there, which kind of makes sense, too. The reason I, I kind of bought into what he was telling me was that he had no way of knowing a lot of things about the whole series of events that he told me without hearing it from someone that was there. And that's what he's saying. Do you know if there were any other tire tracks from any other vehicle there was nothing there was no footprints there was no it was uh like frost on the ground there if you look at the pictures you can see debris which is odd because it doesn't look like debris that's on the side of the road it looks like debris that came out of a car that came out of their car there's water bottles and things like that in the car was uh uncashed paychecks migraine medicine supposedly the broken necklace, things like that. Funny, when you look at her car, do you remember, I don't know about you guys, I don't know how, how old are you guys? Mid thir- mid to late 30s? 27. <laughs> do you remember when you were 17, 18 years old and you'd go out drinking with your buddies up on some country road? I don't know if you guys used to do that. We did all the time. Yeah, absolutely. My, a couple of my buddies drove cars that looked like they came straight out of a junkyard. Well, Brianna's car was the same kind of way. I mean, it was this old beat up thing. It had dents and nicks and Somebody actually took a picture, and it might have been MJA. Somebody took a picture looking at the back of her car underneath by the where the muffler is and everything. And there's these, like, dings and dents and stuff. But those are natural. I mean, they had been there forever. And you could tell just by looking at them, they'd been there forever. I mean, it wasn't like something fresh. People went and took photographs of the car. And that was another thing, you know, where Bruce got upset with, you know, the cars now become this oddity where people, everybody wants to look at the car and everybody thinks they're going to go, oh, I, I see a dent, so I know exactly what happened. Well, pictures were taken. And when you look at the pictures, it's obvious that this car is just, it's at the end of its life. It's been dinged and bent and, you know, scratched and whatever else. It's just the age of the car. So... Those pictures are pretty useless. I mean, not that you're not going to take the pictures, but it's those things people make things out of them that they just aren't. There are photos of the car. There are uh, there were certain things in the car, but they're all personal belongings. It was takeout food and stuff like that in there. It was uh, clothing and stuff like that. The VSP will tell you that they have physical evidence out of the car, and uh, they do. What time of the day? We know that the uh, car was first reported by hikers or skiers, right? What time of the day was yeah, that? Yeah, they were a group of guys. They called themselves the World Travelers, and they were leaving Jay's Peak, which is close. You can actually see Jay's Peak from there, I believe. But they were driving by, and that's that's another thing that really got Bruce and Kelly upset was that police officer stops and looks at it and says, oh, it was a drunk driver or something, and just moves on to the next thing, kind of goes on his long weekend or whatever. And here these got young guys stop and think it's so odd that – they stop and take pictures. They just thought it was bizarre. So, and that's the reason that the family and the public really had pictures. I mean, the, the, the police officer did snap some pictures while he was there. 
Um, and, you know, I never talked to him and I don't know, maybe his, his side of the story is a little different than what I'm, what I'm saying, but it seemed bizarre that he would leave and just move on to something else. I, in my mind, I'd be thinking, what happened here? I mean, this wasn't like somebody slid off the road and went in a ditch. It was purposely backed off the road and the Dutch burn house sat. I don't, they measured it. it was, you know, you're going back 2006, but I couldn't tell you how many feet, but it's a little ways. I mean, they, she would have had to get that car moving in reverse pretty good and to hit that house. Yeah, it looks so, like 10 or 15 feet from the road. It, it does look odd, and I can understand, I can almost relate to those um, hikers uh, who stopped and took pictures because I, I would think that it looked pretty damn weird too. What, it, oh, yeah. It, 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 it had to have gone across the road to get into that position. Again, I think that she, uh, it, it looks as though she pulled over across the oncoming traffic, pulled over and was stopped there, and that's where she starts to go in reverse. And it would still have been a pretty good little, you know, 30, 40 feet. But, um, yeah, the fact that these guys would stop, it was actually, a, I think they were on a ski trip. Oh, okay. And they stopped yeah. and took photos. And they, they were in contact with the family after that a, a little bit here and there when, they, you know, the family wanted to ask them questions. They were really good about it. I mean, I remember the first time I saw this. It is odd. It's it's, but it's more than odd. This is beyond. It it looks like this weird, and I don't want to be disrespectful. It looks like this weird art installation. It looks, you know, with the house that's boarded up, the door of the house, the front of the house is almost the same color as the car. It looks like this weird art installation, it, or some sort of staged photograph. It's like something you'd see in the show Hannibal or something. Something, yeah, in, in some, yeah, it looks like a set. It looks like a staged. It it just looks. It looks like somebody wanted to find it, and and it's very odd. And the fact that people walk, well, they went by it, and it took a group of strangers to be like, "Wow, that's odd." I'm going to take some pictures. A police officer going to this car and not towing it. I mean, not running the plates is just so bizarre to me. Well, I think I think what he did, he did do. Um... Is, to, is he towed it away, but then he just took off, and it went to a tow yard. Later, the Maitlands went into the oh. police station when they, realized, when they realized Brianna was gone. They went to the police station, and they they went in and started asking him some questions, and that officer actually happened to be standing there, and he said, uh, he pulled out a, a photograph, and he said, is this your car? And Kelly's heart just sang. She said, I can't, can't believe it. I, something's obviously wrong. But, you know, and they rushed over to the tow yard and popped the trunk and stuff like that, and you know, initially when they went in, they asked him, do you have the keys? And they said, yes. And then the guy said, well, no, I don't. You know, the keys have never been found. There was a guy by the name of Bob Cates who offered his services to come up there with a, a metal detector. It's kind of a hobby of his and, and look for the keys. And he did. He didn't find them. But, um, yeah, it was just a bizarre situation to look at. And, um, you know, over the years, I would get these tips. One of them was a... a young girl who said my boyfriend told me that he was involved and that they ditched her car there purposely but they were you know, so high at the time that they hit the building by mistake and they just left the car and, but they were sta they, her point was that they were staging it there and you know you don't know what to think it, it almost looked as, as though it's staged yeah. you know with Morris case you can you can look at Morris car in in from the timeline and the witnesses and stuff like that you know she was in an accident you know, this was no accident. I mean, she would have had to skid in the middle of the road, slam it in reverse, and drive quite a distance to hit the building. Right. And we're talking, this is, I'm going to say, what, 1125, 1130 at night. I don't think that there are any streetlights here. Right. Even as like a, a, a 39-year-old male, I wouldn't park my car there. If I'm driving, like, I have no reason to go there. I have no reason, as a 17-year-old female, I have no idea why I would back my car or pull into this creepy-ass house. The only reasonable thing that we heard, and we heard it quite often, and I think I said it on the show, was that Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson were two guys that were in Vermont, and their sole purpose for being there, they didn't have any relatives there, they didn't have any friends there, the sole purpose for being there was they sold drugs. They sold crack. The crack epidemic going, going on at the time. After Brianna's disappearance, an anonymous call came in and said, Brianna's being held in the root cellar of this home on Reservoir Road. So 
uh, some fish and game, uh, police officers uh, went up there and approached the house. Initially, Bruce called them and said, <laughs> you know, if you don't go, I'm going. I'll get some friends and we'll go right now. And they said, no, 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 we'll do it. And they did. Uh, they got everybody out front and center and asked about it. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. And they said, can we come in and look around? And they said, yes. Uh, so the officers went in and searched the house in plain view, which is probably the only way that they could really have pressed the, these issues in plain view was a, a firearm and some drug paraphernalia and some drugs. So inside the house were four people. Two of them were Nathaniel Jackson and Ramon Ryan's. The two other were local people, a guy and a girl. This is going to get a little uh, complicated. As far as I know, Keeley was involved with Nathaniel Jackson at, at one point. Um, eventually, uh, Ryan's leaves uh, a town, and he goes down to Burlington and sets up camp down there in public housing with a girl named Ligia Collins. Ligia is selling crack for him, and... She goes to a home, and she knows the woman in the home, knows the man in the home. The woman decides she's going to steal her crack and her money, so she hits her over the head with a baseball bat, throws her down some cellar stairs, and kills her. She gets her boyfriend and another man named Timothy Cruz. His boyfriend's name is Moses Robar. Uh, the friend's name is Timothy Cruz, who had been released from prison for murder. And they take Legia Collins and they take her up to, a, uh, I believe, to a nature preserve in the leave her out in a wooded area. Ramon Ryans goes and, and, and reports Legia missing. Police go looking into it. They're on to Ellen almost immediately. She didn't go to work the next day. They knew that that's where she had been. Uh, they pull her in. They go to talk to, they pull over Moses Robar to talk to him. He, he pulls over on the side of the road and shoots himself. What, in front of the, in front of the police? Yeah, he just pulls over, puts a gun in his mouth and shoots himself. Alan ends up going to prison for the death of Legia. And that's a whole big sad story also. You know, I spoke to, I spoke to Legia's mother and oddly the way that they found Legia was her stepfather just went looking for her. He just went looking and wasn't going to stop, and he stumbled upon her. That was the story that I was told. But anyway, uh, fast forward, and Ellen Ducharme, who never goes to trial, there's proceedings and there's records of the proceedings and things like that. But she she never goes to trial. She pleads. She's still in prison. Um, she has a sister named Debbie Gordon. Police go to Debbie Gordon's at one point, and they're going to arrest her son on some petty warrant. And she starts screaming at the police officers, if you take my son, I won't tell you what happened to Brianna Maitland. Now, you're talking about an hour, or more than an hour away from where Brianna went missing. Brianna has no, absolutely no ties to Burlington. She doesn't have friends there. She doesn't have family there. Her only tie to that area would be Ramon Ryan's. The officer takes her side, records it, and she gives a sworn affidavit, which is the affidavit that is talked about in the show Disappeared. And she tells off the cuff in front of this officer about a girl who's, you know, she's high profile, so she would have heard Brianna's name before probably. She has nothing to do with her. Tells this horrific detailed story of murder. And that her sister, Ellen Ducharme, Moses Robar, and Ramon Ryans were involved. Albeit, you have to understand that Debbie, from what I understand, is not trustworthy. She's nuts, for lack of better words. But it's interesting, nonetheless, how she would, after a, a good span of time, come up with this just like that, out of nowhere, and tell a horrific story that's really detailed and what happened to her and people's reaction to it when they were there and it was happening and the whole nine yards. When you say really detailed, do you are you referring to details that, that are facts or she just was very detailed in her storytelling? 
Yeah, this is the statement she gave. She gives a statement of her being put through a wood chipper and her head being removed and, you know, where it happened, not where it happened specifically, that it happened on a farm that Moses had worked on and all this other stuff. I mean, it gets really detailed, but it's, it's sickening to read. But the thing that I'm fascinated with with that is, and, you know, if you talk to the police, I think the majority will tell you she, she's just nuts. But I just think it's fascinating that, you know, a couple of years have gone by and it's an hour away, more than an hour away. And someone shows up at this woman's house, is going to pick up her kid on some stupid warrant. She loses her mind and tells us really detailed stories to the cop, lets him tape record it and gives us a, a statement. And were there any details that the police heard from her that they knew weren't something that she might have read in a newspaper or something? I don't know. You know, the, the most I ever got out of them about that, and I didn't really want to push it because, again, you know, they just they don't discuss things like that with a private yeah. investigator. They, it's not, you know, accepted. But I can tell you they don't believe it. They don't, be, they, they don't believe it. They don't believe, believe there's any way to confirm any of it. What about Bruce and Kelly? I think it's another situation if they don't know what to think. I mean, if you look at if you look at Fred and Maura's situation, he's just lost for words. He doesn't he, he doesn't know. He doesn't know anything more than he knew probably the first week. I don't think he I don't think he has an idea of where to turn left or right. In Brianna's case, the only thing that's kind of keeps you a little inspired is the fact that we believe that there are some local people there that we think there's a group of them that we know about that know what happened and that they just won't talk about it. What do you think it will take to get one of these people to talk? Is this being recorded? Yeah. I think that it's a house of cards. I think that there's, if one does, the rest will. I think there's at least three people that know what's going on or what happened. I'm not so sure that Ryan's and Jackson, who were made the, you know, kind of the center of that show, I'm not so sure they have anything to do with it at all. You know, um, there's there's been another group that, that everybody's kind of looked at. So, I don't know. I think if one falls, they, the rest will. And it gets, it gets far more involved and far more interesting. There's just so many weird twists and turns in the story it's it's unbelievable i i can't even believe these parents have had to go through all of this and it just gets more and more and more bizarre <laughs>